Hi, welcome to this edition of On Tap, presented by FCSI The Americas. I'm Wade Kaler, Executive Director. On Tap this week, we welcome one of my favorite FCSI members to have deep thoughts and conversations with. He and I have spent hours at trade shows and conferences, and I valued all the advice he shared with me over the years. It shouldn't really surprise me, though, because he's been a mentor to many people in this food service industry through his multiple affiliations with BCA Global, Multicultural Food Service and Hospitality Alliance, National Organization of Minority Architects, NAFM, and many, many more. He's also the former chair of FCSI of the Americas and currently serving as a trustee to the board for the FCSI of the Americas on his second go around. Please welcome the senior vice president of SSA Group, Mr. Howard Stanford. Howard, welcome to the show. Hey, Wayne, what's going on, man? I, I want you to know, and hello, FCSI. I just want to say, you know, this is a cheap way to try and bribe me <laughs> to come into this thing. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Whatever it takes, man. You know, I, I give and I give till it hurts, Howard. That's how it goes. Uh, yeah, that's how it goes. <laughs> well, you know, as you know, uh, especially being on the board, these are all about getting to know our members better and, and getting for the audience to know about FCSI and who we are better too. So to start with, just tell us a little bit about your background, how you got your start in the hospitality industry, and then how it led to being a food service consultant. Uh, well, you know, watching your other shows, I, I guess it, I have to say I'm kind of the different guy, which is kind of normal for me, right? <laughs> um I do not have a history of food service, um, you know, outside of the typical things that we all of us did working at burger joints, stuff like that. Outside of that, I, I wasn't. I come from a family of mathematicians, musicians, teachers. Um, I am a big Frank Lloyd Wright fan. I've been designing houses since I was eight years old. So doing that and building stuff uh, basically is what I did in the beginning. Went to school for architecture and engineering. Um, and came out and typically, like most people getting out of college, we can't find a job. My mom found a drafting job and it happened to be with Ramal Gatlin back in 81. And uh, for me, the only job that I would ever sit down and do is draw. So it was right up my alley. Um, so that's where I kind of got my, got my start was with uh, Ramal Gatlin. And I've been pretty blessed throughout my career to have some amazing mentors along the way. Stan Gatlin was a big one at the time. Uh, Sherman Robinson, of course, I'm working with one of my mentors, uh, Ken Schwartz, um, and Tom Costello. I mean, some names that people haven't heard yeah. in a while. Yeah. Uh, but Tom Costello and Rudy Mick were big uh, people in my life that helped me through my governing uh, part of my career with FCSI. Yeah. You know, you bring up a name that I know means a lot to you and in his, um, towards his final years before he passed away, uh, I used mm. to absolutely love having him call the office for FCSI <laughs> and, and Sherman Robinson, obviously is who I'm talking about. And Sherman would call, I don't know whether he was bored or whatever it was, but I never cared. He would get on the phone with me and talk for probably 30 to 45 minutes about whatever. And he was just a, uh, a great conversationalist. He loved to tell the history of FCSI and things that he had done in his past and, and things he was still doing, even in his, you know, in 80s, I think, 80s. at this point. Yeah. Um, what did he mean to you? I mean, I, not many people know Sherman because he was a lot older by most of the time current FCSI members would have been active. Yeah. Well, as, as you know, Sherman was the only lifetime member of FCSI. Um, he was also the first African-American secretary yep. for FCSI. Uh, he was the first African-American member right. of FCSI. He joined in 1972. Yeah. Um, I was next. Uh, as far as I know, I'm the only Native American, African-American consultant that came in in 80, what, three? Okay, oh. so that's telling my age. See, I wasn't going to uh, date you at all, but you did it yourself well, you now. you started it with Sherman, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so um, it, it was interesting. Sour, I came in with Sour Mile when he was chair, and he brought in the entire crew, and he was like, you got to meet Sherman, you got to meet Sherman. 
And I'm like, I, I knew of him before I met him. So it, it was certainly an honor to meet him as being the only one Yeah. at, at the time. And then many years down the road, I mean, we certainly kept in, in contact throughout uh, my career before I worked for him. Yeah. Uh, back in ooh, 94, maybe. Yeah. Um, as he was getting older, he was looking for someone to help him out. He was trying to go through some transformations as far as his tools, all the kid, that kind of thing. And I was up for the challenge. So, yeah, it, it was it was truly an honor to work with him. And as you know, if you spoke with him all the time, he's a freaking nutcase and had a, had a story about everything. Yeah, it was you great, know, though. So. You just never knew when he would call. But whenever I'd answer the phone and it was Sherman, and he'd, the moment I heard his voice, I'm like, oh, this is going to be an hour conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm going to love every minute of it. Like, it was, it was one of yeah. those, you just close the emails out and you just sit back and you converse, you know, you have the conversation with him and you enjoy it while you can. And the fact that he still wanted to tell those stories is what made it fun. And he was still animate about it, animated when he would talk to you about it. He was still passionate about it. And so it wasn't just to tell the story. It was, he really enjoyed it. So. Yeah. And, and it was the same. I mean, I saw him, I visited him three months before he passed. Okay. And, uh, went to his house and we sat down, same thing, Wade, sat down with him. We talked for two hours. <laughs> And he just had me cracking up. I mean, I was in tears laughing with him. And we were talking about all the stuff he had gone through with FCSI, his career. And certainly by that time, he was always repeating the same things. But it was still a joy yeah. to hear him talk about it. Like you said, he had a passion yeah. for it. Because he had a lot, of, a, a lot of good, positive memories. I mean, it was for him, FCSI was his life. I mean, that made a, made a big difference in his life, not only as a consultant, but as a person from what everything he told me. So yeah, <laughs> I, I couldn't let that go by without talking about Sherman. Cause uh, I, like I said, I, I love the guy. He was great. Um, getting back to you though. Cause really this was supposed to be about you um, with, with SSA group. Now, what kind of, are there certain segments that you personally specialize in for the, the company? Um, I would say, you know, of course being involved for so long, I mean, I've done about everything. I, I mean, that, that sounds like a cliche, but um, as the industry changed and different firms I, that I work with, you know, Ramal Gatlin, Simi Little, Clevenger Frable, all these other guys, Aramark, I helped out there for a while. So there were always different things that these organizations did that were their forte, I'll say. Um, same here. This this kind of reminds me a lot of Ramal Gatlin back in the day, was that we were doing like these amazing things of differences uh, here. Not only do we design and find widgets, but we have these relationships throughout the industry that help us build amazing things that have never been built. So I, I would say for me, I wouldn't say there's so much a segment of what I do. Um, as far as what type of project, because here we all work on everything. Okay. Uh, but, but for me, I, I think my career was built around details. Okay. So I'm a big spec guy. I spent time with Sethi uh, fabricators back in the day on Long Island and uh, MJAC here in Florida. And I love fabrication. So that kind of detail. And, and when it comes down to, well, we could just build this. I was like, well, not really. You have to do this to make that work kind of thing is, is what I enjoy. And I, and I think that's what I take away from the projects that I do as well. You know, where I, I hear you talk to people about what are their favorite projects, for instance. I don't have a favorite project. And, and people will say it's the last one they did. It will be some huge project they, they did. For me, it's what I enjoy about this industry is you never do the same thing twice. Right. That's why I love it. Yeah. You can call it cookie, cookie cutter all you want. There's something different. There's always a little widget. There's something special that you do uh, to make a, a project work. And the other thing is the relationships of the people that you get to meet. So uh, that, that's where I get my high in, in this business. So I'm supposed to do the interview here, not you. And my oh, next awesome. question was, what's your favorite project? And I can't ask that now because you just <laughs> answered the question. So 
But I'm gonna flip. I'm I'm gonna flip it on you a little bit. Okay. I want to know what your favorite thing is you've ever had fabricated, because you have to choose one of those. There has to be one okay. piece out there that you're like that was cool. A, lo- a long a long time ago, I did a project for um, Conrad Hotels in Jakarta, and we were doing a counter that this guy wanted to make out of all marble. Oh. Marble top, marble front, marble sides. He did want to see stainless, but we had to have a stainless frame, of course. Yeah. And the biggest thing that we had to figure out was something that is pretty simple. Tops are easy, but how do you hang? How do you hang a two-inch thick piece of marble on the front of a counter um, with what that can still be removable? If they had strong enough people to take it off. Yeah. That was the coolest thing I ever did. Just the front of a counter. Because we couldn't, you had to figure the weight. You had to figure the gauge that you were going to use. The frame of the counter had to hold the gauge that was holding the, the marble. You know, so I, I, I think that was like one of the coolest things I had to sit and engineer. Okay. Was to, to figure out that. Okay. See, I, I got you to pin down on something at least. Yeah, I had to think about that. <laughs> What's one thing about Howard that no one would ever guess when they meet you? Oh, let's see, that they don't see on the website? Um, yeah, like a hobby or uh, something along those lines or, or some kind of special background you've got or something of that nature. I was a concert violinist and a classic pianist. Really? I was one of the top violinists in New York back in the day. Now, that's something yeah. even I didn't know, so that's pretty impressive. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are a lot of things that I've, I've done in, over the years, like car racing, motorcycle racing, all those other things. But I had to be one of the coolest things that I really enjoyed because that's what my family was into. So I, I have to ask, because if people aren't aware of your history, you were FCSI, the Americas, or actually back then North American Division chair. And right after your, your uh, reign as, as chair was, was done, you actually left FCSI unhappy with it a little bit um, yeah. with the mm-hmm. association. And, and, we, and, and the association did go through a little bit of a lull there for a while. What made you decide to come back? I mean, what was it about FCSI that you saw that decided it's time for me to come back? Because not only did you come back and become a member, you felt passionate enough, obviously, to become a member of the board again. So what was it that you saw that made you come back? Well, good. I get to put you on. Oh. on uh, <laughs> I, I, but I, I'm, a, I'm, on, I'm honest about this. Um, before I left, you were the best hire I ever made. Thank you. And you said something to me. We kind of talked about it. And you said, I, I, I'm not sure if, if you already knew at the time, but I had gone through some stuff with the board anyway. Um, and when, when you and I spoke, I mean, because you had been there before, David, then you had left, David Drain came, so I knew you then. Yeah. And I was happy that you came back. And we had talked, and I, I don't know if you remember this, but you said, what, I think I know what needs to be done. What do you think needs to be done? And I said, FCSI has to change. It was the reason that I left. It was the reason that a lot of us left because we got stagnant for, for an organization that supposedly has as much power as we do. We didn't change very much. We weren't very inclusive. Um, and if we were supposed to be at the top of the game within the, FCA, within the industry, um, we should have been more inclusive. We should have found a better way to bring more people around us, dealers, everybody else. Because we're all in this thing together. There's a way for us all to work together in an organization just like we do outside the organization. There shouldn't be a separation. And so we kind of talked about that, and and you said you knew that. And um, you're going to, you were going to do something to make FCSI more palatable to the industry as well as its members. And I was like, okay, but we ain't going into, so much of why I was leaving. And that was part of the reason. FCSI wasn't changing. It was doing the same thing over and over. You made changes. I saw changes. We got to talk. And you reached out to all the people 
who had left. All of us didn't come back, but a lot of us still lo loved the organization. And um, I mean, SSA was one of your biggest supporters. And we were like, yeah, we'll do it. We'll, we'll give it a shot and see what we see. And we saw and we stayed. You know, um, for me, outside of you shaming me, you and Bill Caruso <laughs> shaming me to come back. Um, I wanted to do it anyway. And, and I think you guys knew that. Um, because I have a passion for it as well, I always have. And so it, it's truly a joy to be on the board again. And I love telling people, don't keep on doing the same crap. We did this 10 years ago. Figure out a different, you know, put, put another spoke in the wheel and make it right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate that. It's, uh, you know, I'm glad you came back. I, you know, one of the things that, and I, and I can't take credit. I, I'm, I'm just a small little part of a machine, but, um, the one thing that I can say that I loved was at the time Ed Norman was chair and we both reached out to everybody that mm -hmm. left and said, what's it going to take? What do you want to see from your association? What do you want it to look like? And, and let's try to see what we can fix. We couldn't fix everything, but we could at least see what we could mm -hmm. do. And, uh, and so I had the right people with the board involved um, and everybody else that was involved at that point to, to get it moving forward again. And, uh, and it, part of the, the right before it, to be fair to the people right before Ed, we had gone through the recession. So things had come a little bit stagnant by, not by choice, but by necessity, um, right before that. So the, the leadership right before Ed took over was in a rough spot too. Um, but we just happened to be at the right place at the right time and able to, to move it forward. And I think that, you know, my goal still is to keep taking those chances as, as this show shows, we keep taking chances and see what happens. Um, well, you mentioned, you mentioned in inclusivity and, and, and you and I have had this conversation a few times over the years. Um, and I can remember, uh, I don't think it was a last NAFM show, but actually it may have been you and I sat for like four hours one day at the NAFM show floor, having conversations about everything that day. Um, we've seen a lot more females come into FCSI and, and take on leadership roles and be involved. But where we're missing is on the diversity side, I believe still. So what can associations like FCSI or other associations on the back side of the industry, if you will, the stainless side of the industry, what can we do to be become more inclusive and be more diversive and bring in more a more diverse population to not only the boards and everything else, but just the general membership. Well, I, I think the board, I think the, the uh, diversity piece is, is, cert is certainly an issue. I mean, I, I certainly lived through it uh, with this organization. You know, I, I mean, when, when I, when I came on after Sherman, I think uh, Pierre Mattelis came on uh, some years later. And, and of course I, I, Bill Taunton is a perfect example of where FCSI had to make a turn. Bill was the one person I interviewed to be a professional member of FCSI. And at the time, he was the only one from South America that was, that, I mean, he wanted it so bad. Yeah. And I wanted him to be in it so bad. And FCSI, sadly, at the time was like, why do we need somebody from South America? I'm like, how are you, you're an international organization. How do you not do that? Yeah. And they had no answer. They had to do it. And yeah. look what Bill has done. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I think um, for me, as you mentioned at the beginning of the other organizations I've chaired and I'm members of, uh, that was my outreach. You know, that, those, those, that's where I went to reach out to students at the BCA, to reach out to architects at NOMA. Uh, Multicultural was a pretty diverse organization anyway, uh, but they didn't really know that much about consultants. Sure. You know, so it, was, it wasn't only a matter of reaching out for to get more people of color involved and know who we were. It was about being interested in our profession as a whole, as another way to go. Absolutely. Um, but I, I think I think that's that's part that that's part of it. I mean, there are enough people in our organization that have um, 
some amount of color in their background, some diversity in their background. And so I would say members take care, take, take advantage of that and reach out to other organizations, reach out to schools. I mean, I, I'll tell you, I have, maybe they're outside of FCSI. I will tell you the biggest thing that made an impact on my life and what I do was working with Sherman Robinson back in the day, and we had, oh, I don't know, 70 schools in Mississippi that we were doing. And uh, I knew all of those people in, in school food service. For me, as a pre professional of FCSI, for me as a consultant, to go into one of those schools that hadn't been touched since Kennedy did it in the 60s, yeah. To walk to those schools, see those kids that barely get a meal, they were smiling ear to ear to see me come through. And I got to talk to them about what I do. And they were like in awe. Yeah. You know, and I, I've taken that into everything else that I've done is reaching out, talking to people who I am, what we do, and who we are. Sure. You know, so if FCSI as individual members don't do that on their own, they can't expect FCSI to do it without them. Okay. You know, we, we yeah. if, if we want to be diverse, we all need to reach out somehow. Good. Well, you well know? put. Very well put. Very well put. Well, bring, kind of along those lines, then, what's one piece of advice you give to anyone thinking of becoming a food service consultant? Well, I, I tell people like, and even, even our new employees here uh, who have no food service background, um, when, we, when we used to talk about hiring people, uh, I mean, Ken says it all the time as well, which was interesting because we both had the same approach. Um, you, you can't go to school for this. This is not a profession <laughs> that you get a degree in. You get a degree in everything else. You know, this is on-the-job training. The only thing that you can bring as a tool is yourself. Now that, you know, back then it used to be AutoCAD as your tool. Now it's Revit. Um, if you come from interiors, I don't care, engineering, whatever it is, if you, I tell kids, go to trade school, learn Revit. If you can be proficient in Revit, you can go into any consulting firm and learn crew service consulting. Yeah, I there agree. are enough of us that are heads of these firms that can teach you. There's enough places that you can go out with the manufacturers that are always interacting with us. You know, you can go to fabrication houses, you can go out, out on site and see these things and what they are, going to the food service shows and like NAPM and NRA and all these other shows. So there's, you can go millions of places it seems and anywhere in the world to see this because we are the biggest industry on the planet. Yeah. You know, so I, I say just get the tools and, and, you know, keep your eyes open, keep your ears open and your mind open and you can do this. So, so you bring it, you brought up Ken a few times and I question for you is how often do you and Ken put on your SSA team cycling jerseys and ride together? <laughs> He's still getting on me because I don't go out with him. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, we, we, we took a, we have a picture where we took uh, my wife's spinning class. She's a spinning instructor and, and uh, um, what's, what's the uh, Peloton? Oh, Peloton. Thing. And, uh, yeah, so she's been a spinning instructor. Yeah, I met my wife in the gym. Okay. So uh, we're both gym rats and she's done it for such a long time. So we have a picture together on spinning bikes. <laughs> so Ken's like, well, you bought the bike, take it out of your bedroom and come out and ride. So, yeah, we go. <laughs> but Ken's crazy, man. He goes for like 24 miles and 30 miles. I'm like, I know. Dude, I'll go five miles and I'm, I'll meet you at the luncheonette on the way back. Yeah, know? I agree. Do you know anyone that's ever driven a super nice new Mercedes Benz down a flooded street? Oh, that is so mean. That is so mean. <laughs> Welcome to Florida, my brand new Mercedes. I, I guess you heard about that. Well, you can thank your uh, your cohort there to drop that question for me because I couldn't resist once he told oh. me this. <laughs> Welcome to Florida, man. 
Yeah. I, I turned, I turned, I, I saw deep water. I said, oh, I'll just make the left hand turn to go back the other way. I turned the corner. I went in deep. <laughs> my car was done. Uh, I'll, I'll get him for that. Okay. When you're getting things and you get a mental block, what's one tr- tip or trick that you use to get through that mental block? We walk over to the bar and get a scotch. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, I, you know what? I don't think yeah, anybody's going to come up with a better answer than that right there. It, it, work, it, it, works, it works famously. And then we go back to our desk or, or we get like, we'll, we'll get like all of a sudden when stuff just stops, you know, like you're just getting, you're like burned out. Yeah. Luckily we're here. Yeah. So we go grab a scotch, grab a cigar, go out, sit on the deck. Okay. Now we can go back to work. Very so, good. Yeah. That works wonders way. You don't need to stop by that. I, well, your your office is amazing, and I, I recommend any FCSI member that's down in the Tampa area to stop by. Well, that's all the uh, formal questions I've got for you today, Howard. But before I let you go, I do like to have a little bit of fun with everybody, as you know. So um, I've got a set of would-you-rather questions, and so we'll just go down these and peek behind that weird mind of yours. <laughs> would you rather tell bad knock-knock jokes to everyone you meet or talk about yourself in third person all the time? Bad knock-knocks. Would you rather be famous as a comedian or famous as a musician? I'd rather be infamous, but I'll take it as a musician. Would you rather vacation in a luxury penthouse or in the remote wilderness? Penthouse. Ride the scariest roller coaster in the world or bungee jump off the tallest bridge in the world? Oh, come on, man. Neither one of those, but I guess if I have to pick one, I'll take the roller coaster. I hate them both. I like control. I, That's why I'm, yeah. I can understand that. I agree. <laughs> uh, eat a bowl full of jelly beans or a bowl full of Skittles? Jelly beans. Would you rather know all the secrets to space or all the secrets of the ocean? Ocean. Would you rather never do laundry again or never have to do the dishes again? Dishes. Eat the most expensive dessert in the world or drink the most expensive champagne in the world? Oh, champagne. Would you rather be more technologically inclined or better with people? People. Would you rather give up coffee or soda for a year or go without brushing your teeth for a year? I, I, I just, I, I can imagine just breathing bad breath on people I don't like. That would probably be really <laughs> exciting. But I, I'll give up the uh, coffee. All right. The last one. Would you rather fight... Three half size clones of yourself or one full size clone of yourself? One full size. I could probably run away from that one. <laughs> right. The other two will get me. All right. How can uh, people find out more about Howard Stanford or SSA Group? How can they find you? Well, you can certainly find me at FCSI. I love this place. So uh, it's easy to find me at shows and stuff. But uh, as far as the firm, Howard is studiofs.com at uh, SSA. Well, that wraps up this edition of On Tap presented by FCSI of the Americas. A huge thank you to Howard today for joining us. We can't do these type of shows without members like you. So if you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And make sure to also turn on those notifications so you don't miss out on any future episodes. But until then, cheers. Cheers.